And early this morning in prayer, I heard God tell me to let you know that he is waiting by the phone. You might not have gotten through before. The phone might not have rung. The signal might have dropped. You might have gotten a busy signal or an answering machine. But I came to tell you, God is waiting at his phone. He is waiting for you to call. And he said, I promise you, if you call in this time, if you call in this season, not only will I answer, I'm going to respond and I'm going to give you what you called me to get. He said, I'm sitting by my phone waiting to answer. The pain and crying out of difficulty. I came to tell you, even starting on Sunday morning, God's going to change your praise. He's going to change your song. And where you cried out of sorrow and praised out of pain, this Sunday you're going to be praising him out of joy. And you're going to be crying because freedom has come. Deliverance has come. Help and hope has come. When the children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon, and this is what Psalm 126 is talking about. It says that they hung their harps on the trees, saying, how can we sing a song of praise in a strange land? I'm trying to be real with you because you need to praise him even when you're in captivity. Paul and Silas did it in Acts 16. But it's hard to give him a praise that is without burden. I can't, I can't explain some things. Some things you just got to get. It's hard to give him the kind of praise that is without burden, a praise that is free, a praise that is light. When you're in captivity, it becomes easy to hang your harp, your instrument to praise on the willow tree. But I came to tell you tonight that it is time for you to take your harp off the tree and to put your praise back in your mouth and to put your clap back in your hands and your dance back in your feet because the Lord is turning the captivity of Zion. He's about to reverse the curse. For the Lord, verse 3, has done great things for us and for this reason we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south that they that sow in tears, I don't know if I can even get to the rest of my message, that they that sow in tears will reap in joy. For those that go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, will doubtlessly come again with rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves with him. I don't like to cry out of pain. Can anybody help me here? I don't like to be sad. I don't like trouble in my life that breaks my heart to the point where I cry. But since I was about 13 years old and got a hold of this revelation, I understood that every tear that I cried was not just a tear. It was a seed. That right there should have caused you to run around this building with unbridled excitement. Because if you've ever been any, through anything, if you've ever cried yourself to sleep and were still crying when you woke up in the morning, you ought to be screaming right now. Because those tears are not just tears. They're seeds. Those tears are not wasted. They're collected and they're gathered in the soil of the kingdom of God. And you might not be shouting good yet, but you're about to because you have forgotten that a seed is one size, but the harvest is a greater size. That if you put one kernel of corn in the ground, it's not going to come back as a kernel. It's going to come back as a stalk with uh, cobs of corn and thousands of kernels on those cobs. You're not praising him good enough because you don't realize that whatever the measure of pain you've experienced in your life does not even compare to the measure of joy that you're about to harvest. That tear is a seed, and when it comes back, it's coming back. Good measure, pressed down shaking together and running over. What if you laughed 10 times the amount that you've cried? 
What if your joy came back to you 40, 60, or 100 fold above the measure of the pain that you've endured in your life? God, if this dropped into your spirit, I couldn't contain you tonight. Because I've had some seasons in my life where my heart has been broken and I cried and I cried and I cried. I've been under such great pain that my heart skipped beats. I've been under such great pain that I couldn't physically walk. I've been under such great emotional pain that I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And if you think about the weight of that sorrow, not even comparing to the weight of the joy, I said God's getting ready to bury you with joy. He's getting ready to drown you with happiness because he's turning something for you and what you've sowed in tears you shall reap in joy he said those tears I haven't even gotten to the word yet I'm taking my time you guys gave me 36 minutes he said those tears are precious seed costly valuable People ever see anything good in my life that God has blessed me with? That's why I'm going to get on something here. You cannot hate on blessing. Shame on you. My wife come up here and shut me down if I tell you a lie. Have I ever bad-mouthed anybody who had blessing? Have I ever been jealous of anybody's blessing? Have I ever said, why didn't God do it for me? The devil is a liar. Because whenever I see somebody blessed that didn't hustle and cheat to get it, But when I see someone who's legitimately blessed by God, I know without hearing them open their mouth that they paid a price behind closed doors. I don't have a lot in my life. I don't have extravagance in my life. There are people who are living better and more blessed than me. But there's not a day that goes by that I don't thank God for the car I drive, the house I live in, and the family I got because I paid for it. I sold for it. I sowed precious tears of heartbreak, loneliness, isolation, people hating me, people jealous of me, people shooting at me when I was four years old playing in my backyard. I paid a price for what I have on my life. And if you pay a price for what you got, tell the haters to shut up and get behind you. You sowed for your blessing. You sowed for that oil. You sowed for that anointing. And God is getting ready to give you your harvest. You better praise him good tonight. You better praise him good. I'll move on. I'll move on. Back to Jeremiah 33, verse 14. He said, behold, the days are come. Behold, the days come, excuse me, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. No meaningless details in the scripture. Look at verse 14 with me. No matter what translation you have, you'll find this to be accurate. Behold, the days come. That is not the word day with an apostrophe S. So it's not saying the day is come or the day has come. It says days, plural. That's what God woke me up with this morning. The rest, I was just having fun with you. You are getting ready to step into, not a day, but days, a perpetual season of perpetual favor, of perpetual blessing. That means it's just going to go in a circle. And when it gets to where it started, it's going to start all over again. And when it gets back to where it started, it's going to start all over again. You are not getting ready to have a day. You are getting ready to have days, a season of perpetual blessing. He said, behold, the days come, plural, where I will perform that good thing. Now, some of y'all have been going through some trouble. Don't shout me down. Some of you have had some bad things happening. Let me just check you and help remind you that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father above. So if anything negative and bad is happening, that is not God. That is not of God. He's not punishing you. He's not sending something upon you. That's the enemy. 
And I came to tell you that you are getting ready to step into a perpetual season where good things are going to happen. Now, I know none of this is deep preaching, but my God, if it happened... Have you ever had a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, where you were overwhelmed by bad news? We went through 18 years of it. Every other day, something happened that was horrible. Every day, we got further away from possibility. You ever been in a season like that? where you just get overwhelmed with attacks, overwhelmed with adversity, overwhelmed with bad news. What if God would bring you into a day where goodness overcame you and attacked you like trouble's been attacking you? Deuteronomy 28 says it like this. It's a season where the blessing of God will overtake you. (laughs) <laughs> where it's nipping at your heels. We got ourselves a little puppy dog, and she loves to bite. She's teething. And we used to blame all of our children's bad behavior on teething, but now they got all their teeth. We got to blame the puppy's behavior on teething. And she's always biting stuff. And, and every, every other day or whatever, she'll get to biting at the kid's feet or the bottom of their pajamas. And you know what they do? They take off running. And that little dog, he's chasing them. Until eventually, you know what happens? She overtakes them. They trip, they fall, or they just can't run any faster. They get their feet caught, and they fall, and then the little puppy gets on top of them. And <laughs> that's what the blessing's about to do. It's nipping at your heels. And no matter how fast you run, it's going to catch up to you. And it's going to overwhelm you. And it's going to overtake you. Blessings about to lick your face. Healing is about to jump on top of you. Overwhelm you and overtake you. The blessing of the Lord is about to overtake you. Good things are about to happen. But let's look specifically at what this verse says. He said, you're going to come into days, a season, not a day, but days, where I'm going to perform that good thing. Everyone say that. He was referring to one specific thing. I'm going to move on. I won't be much longer, I promise. I want you to take a minute right now to think about that thing. Y'all have one. I'm not talking about, well, it'd be nice if God did this and be nice if he could do that. It'd be nice if he worked. No, no, no. What's that one thing? When I was in my situation with my family, if there was ever a prayer line, I came up for one thing. Whenever someone would say, you need your miracle, shout it out. It was that one thing. And some of you are like, well, I got 150. Well, maybe the one would fix the 149. (laughs) What is the one thing? Blind Bartimaeus sat on the roadside begging for what? Money. Because he was blind, he couldn't work. But when he saw Jesus, he said, give me my sight back. The one thing. And that'll fix the fact I don't have a job. And that'll fix the fact I don't have any money. Because if I can see, I can work, and I can get all the money I need. Focus your faith on the thing. The one thing that has eluded you, that has escaped you, that has slipped through your fingers. It's broken your heart and caused you to cry those tears that I just told you were seeds. What would you do And how would you worship? How would you praise? How would you respond? How would you thank God if you step into a season where he gives you that thing? I ask God today, how could you give one thing and say it's a season? Because, you know, once you get it, you got it. And he said, it's a season because once I give it to you, you're never going to have it taken away again. Once it's there, it's going to be there. 
and the thief, the robber, the devourer will not be able to take it from you again. What is your thing that you've been praying for? How would you worship? How would you respond? How would you thank him? How would you praise him if he gave you that thing? Some of you are like, I have no idea because I've never thought about it. I'm telling you tonight prophetically that God is getting ready to release that thing. How do you know? Because I know the times and the seasons of God. I know when it's time to call for rain in the time of latter rain. I said to you tonight prophetically, God is getting ready to release that thing. As you step into a season of perpetual favor, perpetual blessing, not just things, but that thing is going to come to you. I'm not done prophesying. I'm not done preaching. But I think you need to take 30 seconds, whether you need to lift your hands, pray in tongues, or pray in understanding, fall on your face, run around the building, dance yourself a jig. I don't care what you need to do, but you need to show God tonight that I believe that thing is about to be released. I'm showing you by the lifting of my hands, by the opening of my mouth. I'm showing you by the buckling of my knee. I'm showing you by standing here tonight with my hands lifted high. I believe that thing is on its way. In Jesus' name, that thing is on its way. Right now, where you are, just take a step. Some of you aren't standing. You can real quick if you can. If not, just scoot over one seat. But just take a step and make a movement and let it be symbolic tonight that you're stepping out of a day into days. You're stepping into a season of perpetual blessing and perpetual favor where God is going to give you that thing. I'm not done just yet, but you need to start stepping. You need to start walking. I'm stepping out of a day into days. I'm stepping out of a day into a season where God is going to not just give me things. He's going to give me that thing. He's going to give me. That thing. Can I give you the rest of the word? You just stay standing. You stay walking. I won't be long. Something's happening here. But please hear this. This, this is really, this is it. This is the gist. Everything hinges upon this. Because some of you still are trying to believe but you're not totally convinced. I'm going to seal it here. In verse 20, just remain standing. The Lord said, if you can break my covenant of the day or my covenant of the night, that there should no more be day or night in its appointed season, then also will my covenant with David be broken. How many of you feel like you have the faith or the spiritual clout to walk out of these doors right now, if you want to do it, you can, and command the night to go away and immediately the sun will come up? I, I don't feel like I have that clout. Or maybe you feel like if you can go up, wake up in the morning and say, you know what, dear God, I wish I had this gift. Six o'clock is too early, so I bind the time. In Jesus' name, it is only three in the morning, and we're going to sleep another three hours. <laughs> None of us have that kind of faith. Watch. It is because God has made a covenant with day and with night with light and with darkness. And that covenant assures that they rest in their appropriate time and their appropriate season. 
Okay. So, over the years, the history of man, we've gone from Adam and Eve wearing fig leaves to people having the ability to wear Gucci. We went from people having to walk for miles to deliver a message to people then going and sending a message to now having phones where we can message people all around the world, instant messaging. We have gone from people living in huts made of brick and mud to people living in homes with mortar and brick and wood and drywall. We've gone, thank you Jesus, from people using the bathroom in a hole they dug in the backyard to a great porcelain throne. But as the earth has changed, as men have knocked down trees, as men have built homes, as they've moved mountains, as they've created valleys, the sun has always come up. And the night has always come because there is a covenant. So for this, we never wonder or worry. Is the sun going to come up tomorrow? Oh, it's been a long day. I wonder if it will actually cool off and get dark. Think about if you go to bed at night and you say your little evening prayers. Lord, bless mama and daddy, auntie, uncle. Bless all the people who are without food in the world. And dear God, please, please, if you don't answer anything else, please answer this. Please let morning come tomorrow. Let the sun come up. No. You take it for granted. You just don't even think about it because the sun is going to come up. There's a covenant that has been made. And what God was saying here is I've made a covenant with David, which is a, David was a forefather to Jesus. Jesus, the lineage of David. We, the joint heirs, the brothers and sisters of Christ. He said, I've made a covenant with you. Just like I made a covenant with light and darkness. Just like I made a covenant with day and night. If you miss this, you've missed the whole reason you're here tonight. What he was trying to say is, is that it would be easier for you to break his covenant with morning and evening. It would be easier for you to tell the sun to stop shining in the morning and the darkness to go away at night than it would be for him to break his covenant with you. You go to bed not even thinking about the fact that in the morning sun's gonna come up, morning's gonna come. Yet most of you go to bed every night wondering, will I ever have peace? Will I ever have joy? Will God ever restore what's been taken? Will my heart ever mend and heal? Will my marriage ever be okay? Will my children ever serve the Lord again? Will my children ever accept a phone call from me again? Will my body ever be healed or will this disease take me out? And I came to tell you, why don't you go to bed tonight with the same confidence and assurity that the sun will rise in the morning, that your God will finish what he's started and he'll be faithful to complete the good work he's begun in you why don't you have the same confidence and faith because with the same veracity the same intensity and the same power that he executes every day the appointment of day and night the covenant with day and night with that same veracity with that same intensity with that same fervor and fire He'll execute your blessing, your miracle, the answer to your prayer. Let me put it to you like this. Man has a better chance of keeping the sun from rising tomorrow morning than sickness has a chance of keeping you from your healing. Better chance than lack has of keeping you poor and impoverished. Better chance than depression and sorrow has of keeping you bound keeping you from your joy and from your peace. Oh, that we could have the same confidence that God would do for us the covenant that he's made. The same confidence that we know that the sun will shine in the morning and the evening will come when the day is over. That tonight, God, is the confidence and faith that we have in you. It's your covenant with us as 
secure and as sound, as solid, as faithful and consistent as the sun will rise tomorrow. I end with this. He told him, speaking to David, the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea be measured, so I will multiply your seed, David. Similar to what he spoke to Abraham, isn't it? When he said, your seed will be that of the sand of the seashores, the stars in the sky. In other words, he was saying that it would be easier for you to measure the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, than it would be for you to measure what I'm going to do for you. Simply put, God wants to do so much for you. It's gonna be impossible for you to measure it. It's gonna be impossible for you to even keep track of it. You ever had a season, a year, a decade, where when someone asks you, well, what's been going wrong? Like, I can't even begin to tell you. I don't even know where to start. Come on, preach, preacher. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to begin with. Well, it was this and then it was that and uh, there's just more things than I can even remember. What if God was about to do stuff for you that was so much that you tell people, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just, I don't know where to start. For a donation of $20 or more, we would like to thank you by sending you Pastor Jonathan's three-part series, Light. Just visit our website and click the Donate Now link. Thank you for your support.